Hi, this is Nick Butler from the Charleston County Public Library. I'm here in White Point Garden to remind you that this Sunday, June 28th, is Carolina Day, a big holiday in South Carolina and especially here in Charleston since 1777. Remember, that's the date that we remember the battle that took place on Sullivan's Island just ahead of me on uh, the 28th of June, 1776, when a British fleet sailed into Charleston Harbor thinking they were gonna attack the city, and they never got past this unfinished Palmetto Log Fort on Sullivan's Island. So in the past few years, I've done three separate podcasts about Carolina Day, trying to tell the story. And in 2018, I stood right about here and gave a speech to a crowd of four or 500 people about remembering Carolina Day. So this year, I'm not going to rehash the story, but I am gonna invite you to celebrate Carolina Day this year by looking back at episode 118 or episode 71 or episode number 117 on the Charleston Time Machine. So last year's 2019 essay about Carolina Day is actually the script of the speech that I gave here in 2018. So that entire speech from 2018 is online as well. So you're welcome to watch that. If you can't get outdoors to your own personal celebration of Carolina Day, you can join us virtually through the Charleston Time Machine at the Charleston County Public Library. Thank you. The Battle of Sullivan's Island was not the first battle of the American Revolution. It was not even the first exchange of gunfire here in South Carolina. It was, however, the first clear and indisputable victory in our American war for independence. And the significance of that fact reverberated from Sullivan's Island to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, to the Houses of Parliament in London, and even to the court of Louis XVI at Versailles. It demonstrated to the world that raw American troops composed of farmers, shopkeepers, tradesmen, merchants, planters, immigrants, and even enslaved Africans were resolutely determined to stand their ground and to defend their dreams of liberty. Most of you here today know the story of the Battle of Sullivan's Island backwards and forwards. So what can I say that might be new or different from other commentators on this same subject? This is certainly not the time or the place to recount every detail of the battle. So rather, I'd like to try to increase your appreciation of the significance of the battle we celebrate today with a few remarks about its general context. The Battle of Sullivan's Island took place just 14 months after the first open acts of rebellion here in South Carolina, which took place in April of 1775. The battle was fought by raw troops drawn from South Carolina's provincial army which was created just 12 months before the battle commenced. This major battle, the largest of its kind in South Carolina's century-long history, took place just four months after this state had tentatively declared its independence and adopted a state constitution in late March of 1776. The 28th of June, 1776, was also the day that Thomas Jefferson presented the first draft of the Declaration of Independence to our Continental Congress, declaring that the 13 separate British colonies were henceforth to be known collectively as the sovereign United States of America. The Battle of Sullivan's Island took place on a single day, commencing at about 11 a.m. and concluding just after 9 p.m. But that day of action was choreographed well in advance. The British, the British fleet arrived off the bar of Charleston Harbor on the 1st of June, 1776. During four restless weeks preceding the battle, the American and British forces watched each other closely as they chose their positions and deployed their resources. It was like a slow motion game of chess acted out in complete silence before the first shot was fired. In commemorating the Battle of Sullivan's Island, I believe it's important to remember that Sullivan's Island was not the primary target of the British operations here in the summer of 1776. Certainly, the British Navy expected to exchange fire with the American troops in that unfinished fort on Sullivan's Island, but their goal was to penetrate the harbor defenses and attack Charleston. 
The British never expected to face such fierce and determined resistance, however. And frankly, the American command staff did not expect the raw troops stationed on Sullivan's Island to persevere. How do we know this? Consider for a moment how the American troops were deployed in the weeks leading up to the battle. The American forces in Charleston at that time numbered just over 6,500 fighting men, including South Carolina Continental troops, South Carolina militiamen, su supplemented by Continental troops drawn from Virginia and North Carolina. When the battle commenced on the 28th of June, 56% of the men, 56% of the men were positioned here on the peninsula of Charleston to defend the town. Just over 20% were stationed at Hadrill's Point near the old village of Mount Pleasant. Colonel William Thompson's riflemen, so important in the story of this battle, they were defending the north end of Sullivan's Island. They constituted just 12% of the total American forces. At Fort Johnson, over here on James Island, Colonel Christopher Gadsden commanded a small garrison that represented about 6% of the total. So finally, the 435 men inside that unfinished Palmetto Log Fort on Sullivan's Island, including the entire South Carolina 2nd Regiment and a small detachment of the 4th Regiment, all under the command of Colonel William Moultrie, represented about six and one half percent of the available American soldiers. Six and a half percent of the total force. Likewise, the distribution of gunpowder and ammunition was commensurate with that division of troops. That is to say, the bulk of the American supply of gunpowder and shot was reserved here for the defense of urban Charleston, which was deemed to be the most important asset to protect. The relatively small body of men assigned to defend that unfinished Palmetto Log Fort on Sullivan's Island were purposefully given a proportionately small amount of ammunition. The American forces here on the peninsula were moderately well supplied with gunpowder and shot before the battle. But Colonel Moultrie knew well before the fight began that he was already handicapped by an inadequate supply of firepower. From this sort of analysis, it's clear that the American army was circling its wagons, to borrow a later expression, around the town of Charleston. Both sides expected the firefight at Sullivan's Island to be just a prelude to the main event, which was a naval and amphibious assault on Charleston's eastern waterfront. To meet this danger, the American commanders positioned the bulk of their artillery behind a palmetto log wall that stretched the length of East Bay Street and behind the robust fortifications here at White Point. In fact, Charleston's artillery company, the prestigious Charleston Artillery Company, commanded by Captain Thomas Grimble, was stationed right here, where we are standing within a fortification known as Broughton's Battery, which in the summer of 1776 was known as Grimble's Battery. General Charles Lee, the commander of all the American troops in this area in June of 1776, thought it was folly to devote valuable resources to the defense of Sullivan's Island. He believed the British Navy would quickly decimate Colonel Moultrie's troops as the warships sailed into the harbor. Lee would have preferred to keep those troops here on the peninsula to defend the town, but in the end, he bowed to local pressure President John Rutledge and other local military commanders thought it was well worth the effort to attempt to stop the British from entering the harbor, or at least to slow their advance at Sullivan's Island. General Lee reluctantly agreed to their plan, but he ordered Colonel Moultrie, as soon as he ran out of ammunition, to spike the guns and evacuate the fort. In this context, we can better appreciate the steely resolution displayed by Colonel Moultrie and his troops on the 28th of June. They knew they were undersupplied and outmatched. They understood that their own superior officers did not expect them to persevere. 
They knew that the veteran British troops were expecting to breeze past that unfinished fort with minimal resistance. But despite all of these disadvantages, those 435 raw American soldiers rolled up their sleeves and dug in for a hard fight. In the 10-hour battle that took place on the 28th of June, 1776, the British Navy aimed nearly 300 cannon at Fort Sullivan and expended approximately 17 tons of gunpowder to fire more than 50 tons of iron shot. The Americans inside the unfinished fort had just 31 cannon and expended just over two and a half tons of gunpowder gun powder, to fire about seven tons of iron shot at the British Navy. The American forces were outmatched by a ratio of nearly eight to one. But yet they won the day with only 11 men killed and 25 wounded. It was an extraordinary victory. It was heroic, miraculous, providential, even epic. How did they do it? Well, I can think of at least four reasons, that four factors that sealed the fate of the battle on that historic day. First, the American troops were strengthened by the sincere faith in the righteousness of their cause. Second, the defenders of Fort Moultrie, whose statue is commemorated behind me, uh, Fort Moultrie were empowered by the resolute determination displayed by their own commander, William Moultrie. Third, the Americans were aided by the resilient properties of Mother Nature, the spongy palmetto, palmetto trunks, the shock-absorbing sand within the fort's walls, and the deceptive watercourses that confused British intelligence and prevented the enemy from positioning troops to their advantage. And finally, the men who faced the British war machine on the 28th of June were inspired to fight on by the brave acts of their fellow soldiers in the heat of battle. Early in the day, when the flag of the 2nd Regiment was shot down by a British cannonball, Sergeant William Jasper braved a hail of cannon fire to rescue the fallen flag and replant it atop the rampart. His reckless enthusiasm was far more than just folly. The flag was a powerful symbol that represented their cause. Spirits drooped when the flag fell. But Sergeant Jasper revived their spirits and the spirit of determination at a critical juncture in the battle. Likewise, Moultrie's men were inspired by the dying words of Sergeant McDaniel, who was disemboweled by a British cannonball. Fight on, my brave boys. Fight on, my brave boys, McDaniel said to his comrades with his last breath. Don't let liberty expire with me today. Each year, on the 28th of June, we honor the memory of Sergeant McDaniel and his brave compatriots by recalling their deeds and the eternal debt we owe to their sacrifice. Had the British plan prevailed on the 28th of June, the engagement at Sullivan's Island would have been merely the appetizer course in a feast of violence in which downtown Charleston would have been the main course. The history of South Carolina and the history of the United States in general would have been far different had the British prevailed on that fateful day. But the brave boys in blue on Sullivan's Island won the day and spoiled the British appetite for both the turf and the surf of South Carolina. In the course of American history, our nation has survived hundreds of battles, but not every battle is remembered by annual commemorations. We have general days remembrance like Memorial Day and Veterans Day, but many battles, in fact most battles, are not individually commemorated on every anniversary. Why is the Battle of Sullivan's Island different? Why have people been commemorating the anniversary of this battle ever since 1777? Why was a society formed specifically to perpetuate the memory of this battle? The answer, in short, is that the outcome of the Battle of Sullivan's Island 
was so unexpected, both to the victors and to the losers, so inspiring to the people of South Carolina and to the larger American struggle for independence, and so important to the history of our nation. As a teacher, I'm always thinking about how to summarize big stories into smaller bite-sized themes that are easier to digest. So what lessons can we learn from the Battle of Sullivan's Island? What message summarizes the spirit that won the day? What theme can we derive from this victory and pass on to future generations of Americans? Personally, I draw inspiration from a phrase coined by President John Rutledge of South Carolina on the 28th of June, 1776. During the height of the battle, when observers standing right here at White Point witnessed the success of the American firepower, President Rutledge ordered a boat to deliver an extra 500 pounds of gunpowder to Sullivan's Island. Along with that powder, Rutledge also scribbled a note to Colonel Moultrie, urging him to use this supply of ammunition slowly and deliberately. In the heat of battle, Rutledge concluded his note by advising Moultrie, cool and do mischief. Cool and do mischief. That pithy phrase, rendered in more verbose language, might sound something like this. Steady your nerves, sight your targets as precisely as possible, and use the limited resources at hand to inflict as much damage as possible to the enemy. In civilian context, we might translate Rutledge's advice like this. Calm your mind. Identify your goals as clearly as possible. Ignore the distractions of life and work diligently to overcome the obstacles that stand between you and success. I think that's a noble admonition, both in 1776 and in the present day. Cool and do mischief. If anyone's inclined to print up some t-shirts with that slogan, I'd be happy to wear them here next year. <laughs> I'd like to conclude my remarks today by recalling another anecdote from the summer of 1776. On the morning of the battle, excuse me, on the morning after the battle, General Charles Lee, here in Charleston, sent a short note to William Moultrie promising to visit the battle-scarred fort very soon. In the meantime, the general wrote, I have applied for some rum for your men. They deserve every comfort that can be afforded them. And so, on this hot summer's day, I think it's fitting that we should all raise a glass to the memory of those brave men whose memory we so celebrate today. And whether your glass contains celebratory dram of rum or just plain refreshing water, I invite you in to join me in toasting the memory of those brave men who fought and died for our liberty 242 years ago today. Cool and do mischief. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.